For those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. The Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by M. John Harrison, considered one of the most important stylists of modern fantasy and science fiction working today and a pioneer in the new wave. Mike is a cartographer of the liminal. Tonight, we're lucky to uh, be joined also by Dr. Helen Marshall, who joins us to moderate the conversation. She, in her own right, is an acclaimed writer, editor, and book historian. And as director of the Angular Ruskin Center for Science Fiction and Fantasy, her recent research is focused on the weird fiction, a subgenre of fantasy which blends the supernatural, mythical, and scientific writing. So to make this a truly weird night, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming M. John Harrison and Dr. Helen Marshall to Virtual Futures. Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for having us and uh, for all of you for coming out today. This is a really interesting venue. And I think we were both commenting on the fact that we feel sort of in the midst of a weird space at the moment, as if these chairs are about to devour us. Uh, why don't we, there's, there's a lot that you said there that was very interesting about burying the 20th century and moving into the 21st century. And why don't we circle back to that, uh, in, in a little bit. I thought what we would do is we would start off by having a conversation and then Mike will read for us and then we'll open up the conversation to the audience. Uh, but Mike, do you want to start simply by telling us a little bit about the book? <coughs> yeah. First, I'd like to introduce my companion for the evening. This is um, the microphone, I guess. Um, uh, I can't see Helen over it. Uh, it's, um, it's a collection of short stories uh, through which is interleaved uh, a load of flash fiction, essentially. Uh, but the stories and the flash are themed. There are about four themes. Uh, and the flash tends to control the <clears throat> the order of the stories, and the stories tend to control the order of the flash, so that the themes thread and weave about. And it's kind of uh, at the end of it, you should feel you've had a single experience rather than just read a collection of short stories. But it's also um, an almost classic piece of late style uh, where the author who <clears throat> has finally achieved <laughs> the ancient age of 70 odd uh, is now able to look back at the things uh, that they wanted to do when they were 20 or 25 only now technically they can do it and so I had a lot of fun doing things that I couldn't do when I was on New Worlds. When I say couldn't, I, I, I certainly tried, but I was not technically capable. Whereas now, I feel as if I am. So that's what you're getting. Well, that, that's quite promising, isn't it? Um, it's really interesting to, uh, I, I've had a chance to read the book and I think it's fantastic. So I hope you can all uh, find copies of it. Uh, I think one of the th things that's particularly interesting about it is the way that it plays with or responds to or, or often undercuts genre and genre tropes in quite funny and subversive and ironic ways. Uh, when you're thinking about the work that you wanted to do when you were younger, uh, is that the kind of work that you were really looking to do or, or what aspect of the uh, technical skill do you feel like you've mastered now? What is it that you're doing differently now than you were doing before? I wanted to be able to do everything at once. Uh, for, for, for me, uh, 
genre has never really existed in the sense that I couldn't see why you couldn't combine genres. Uh, the problem is when you're 21, that's rather difficult to do. <laughs> Um, you uh, partly because you don't have experience in the genres themselves, which which you need to get before you can start combining and and recombining them and using one to undercut the other. Uh, a, I, a very early ambition was to use sci-fi to undercut literary fiction, but at the same time use literary fiction to undercut sci-fi. But of course, to be able to do that, you have to be able to do both. Um, and the guys at New Worlds were, were they were they were very kind to me <laughs> in allowing me to kind of perform some of these experiments and and then publishing them. So that basically, again, that's what it is. Is this for me? Most most generic solutions to the problem of a story are ordinary. Um, and, a, and a good way to make them less ordinary is, is to pick and mix. I think one of the elements I found in terms of reading the short stories that most struck me and I, uh, that I found really technically exceptional was your last paragraphs have a tendency to, to, to almost offer little vignettes that seem connected and resolve the short stories that have come before, and yet uh, also act as denouements that are quite different necessarily from where you thought the story might be going. And I thought that was really, really wonderful. Yeah, that's the um, that's a technique I stumbled across in the mid-80s when I wrote a last paragraph to a story and looked down at it and thought, why did you do that? <laughs> um, and for days, I kept coming back to it and looking at it and thinking, you know, that's great, but I, I really don't know why you did that. And I now look for that moment. I look for that exact, I don't know why you did that mo moment. Uh, it, it has to work for the story, obviously, and it has to push it in a direction which, if even as the author you don't know it, is great, but at the same time, it has to solve the structure uh, in, a, in an oblique fashion. There's a story called Dog People, which ends, well, I can't tell you how it ends, obviously, <laughs> can I? Because that would be a spoiler. So we'll move on from there. <laughs> it's, I think that's really interesting what you were saying. Uh, recently, uh, my university started up a new science fiction magazine and we were looking to train some slush readers and so I had offered to give them some short stories I had written when I was in university that I don't think work very well but their sentences work if you see what I mean so and I feel like that's a good test for a slush reader to see if you can read work that has good sentences but doesn't really work as a piece and I read one story, which was probably the last short story I wrote before I started getting published. And uh, and it was the one, I think, where I was kind of bridging things a little bit. And I could tell there was the last paragraph for that was something where the story, it stretched the story beyond the time frame, I think, that you would expect for a genre story, which I think is what a lot of your writing does, is there's sort of a point at which you think a story might end, and then it goes one step further, it goes sort of off at an angle that gives you an entirely different perspective on what you've seen before. Yeah, I mean, but that, really, that's a, a base part of the method is to, is to, flip the direction that the reader thought the story was going in, but not to not to do that kind of 50s thing or 20s and 30s thing where you um, where the ending is still logical. Where the weird comes in is that you flip it and you flip it with this kind of oblique look off or you take up a um, you you originate a new context from which the story might be looked at by the reader or a new time frame or whatever else. Anything in that last paragraph or in the case of a novel, the last chapter, or in the case of a flash or a poem, the last sentence, you know, the last line, that's my aim is always to, is, is to recontext it. And if, it, if that doesn't happen for me, I, I find the story boring. 
and I would never put the right ending on, you know. Yeah. But you put the right ending on and the story is as dead as a doornail in front of you and you did all that work. Why would you want that, <laughs> you know? So for me, endings like that, they keep the story alive for, for me as well as for the reader. Yeah, I think that's a really good point is that when you, when you start kind of honing in on, a, on an ending you can see too far from the distance, as soon as you get there, you sort of know that you have to go somewhere else. Yeah, you know that's not the ending, yeah. basically. That's, that's the expected ending. That's, yeah. the, uh, that's the kind of, that's the sad ending. So that, uh, that brings me to another topic that I'm quite interested in, which is the intersection of the new wave and then the sort of beginnings of the new weird. We were talking about this a little bit before is uh, in around 2003, you had a kind of anxiety that you were talking about that uh, as soon as you start codifying something like the new weird or the new wave, then there's a danger that there's going to be a second wave of generation, a uh, second generation of writers who end up mimicking what came before, but lose something of the freshness or the radical nature of what was going on. Um, and so I, I like what you were talking about, of weirdness in terms of structure, something in the structure of a weird story that causes it to go oblique. Because I do wonder if what we're seeing now is a codification of weird tropes to some extent. What do you think about where weird is right now? That's problematic for me because I haven't actually read an awful lot since then. Uh, what happened to me during that conversation was that <clears throat> I took my own advice to heart. Very suddenly I thought I mustn't just talk about this um, because actually I'm talking to myself here. What I'm saying is don't allow yourself to be defined um, because the moment that happens you will be, be begin to become a self-cliche. Um, you've got to keep things fluid. The, what I learned from being in the new wave is that once it atrophies, once it's been going for about 10 years, whether there's a new generation or not, it gets tired and it will develop very typical pathways and it will develop very typical, even typical subject matter, which is the last thing you want. Uh, Given that writers are kind of individuals, you want them to act individually and you want them to bring individual ideas to the table. And I think when there's a movement at the beginning of a, a movement, that's a very exciting process. And you do get lots of ideas slapped down on the table. Um, but pretty soon, commerce and capital make it absolutely certain that 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 a filter process will go on. And what that does is to filter out anything that's not quite on the line, not quite in the mainstream of, 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 the, um, of the movement. And suddenly there you are, you've got a subgenre uh, out of nowhere. And, and that's the last thing you wanted when you started a movement, when, when you all got together, got horribly drunk and said, this is it guys, we've learned the secret of the universe. You know, well, the real secret of the universe is don't try and learn the secret of the universe, I think. And whatever you do, don't then capitalize on it because you'll run it straight into the ground. So what I did was to close my mind to that whole discussion and to what came after uh, and follow the kind of moves that I've been making in the late 90s. I was extremely interested in the kinds of stories that I was writing then, they had that ending, they had that flipped ending. Um, they were highly mainstream. The story would begin in a, <clears throat> there's a story in, in this collection which appears to be an almost non-fiction about two steeplejacks working on a, on a church, pinning a church back together with uh, space age technology using abseil techniques and in fact, it, it seems like that because it is the notes from a from a non-fiction book about <laughs> abseil engineering that I that I hoped to write at one point and never did. And I, I looked at the notes and I thought, what else can I do with these? And I thought, well, it's a candidate for this kind of tipping. Um, there is here a, 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 an absolutely Jamesian horror story. Um, Will 
we'll do that, but we'll take every item of horror out of it. And then we'll put the flip on the end and we'll leave the reader thinking, my God, something terrible happened here. Something ugly that was, that was predicated in the first paragraph, but, but I haven't got a clue what it was. Um, and when I finished that, I looked down at it and I thought, yeah, hoe your own row, Mike. This is weird and people may not like it, but, but it's, if you want a definition of the weird, that's, that story certainly is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the things that I did over the last 18 months or so was I, I read all of the work that, all of the short stories that were being designated as weird that were being produced. And then um, I, I assembled a number of them for the year's best weird fiction, which I have over here. But I found much of what you're talking about that in order to do that effectively, it actually involved rejecting a huge amount of s stories that are being called weird and trying to figure out where genuinely weird stuff was being published because it often wasn't in the places that you might go to because that label's being attached to it. So there, there's always kind of a, a, a looking towards the margins, isn't yeah. there, for new yeah. material. I think that's where you're going to find, if, if you're going to use the word weird, that's where you're going to find it. You know, and my method is certainly not the only one. And everybody has their own subject matter. Mm -hmm. And everybody should be following it, I think, where it leads. And it's also that interesting idea of taking elements of genre and seeing how much you can actually cut out of them and still maintain the effect of the genre. Because I think that story you're talking about is really interesting for exactly that reason. How much can you remove and give the effect of a horror story without s the signals, the direct signals of a horror story? And sometimes that can be really useful in order to get around people's preconceived notions of what the pattern of the story is going to be. Yeah, I think structure is everything. Yeah. If you read a lot of horror or a lot of anything, you will you'll begin to understand the the structures um, and see the structure as uh, one of my early images for this, which was very crude, was the idea of, you know, a cup is a cup. It doesn't matter what you pour into it. Uh, the structure of a horror story is the structure of a horror story. It doesn't matter actually what you put there or what you take out. As long as you leave the structure, people's expectations will be, it will, will like, like a planet, you know, following the geodesic of space time, that they, they, they will go in the right direction. I, I did it first in about 1976, 77, uh, with a, a story called The Ice Monkey, where uh, I wrote the story as, as a horror story, uh, in which, you know, the guy was cursed by having the, the little silver monkey on the chain. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, that, that's fair enough as far as it goes, Mike, but really, you know, it's a bit ordinary. So then I thought, well, all right, let's take it all out and see what happens. Let's take everything out. But in the end, three lines in that story tell you that it's a horror story, or there are three lines that contain anything that you might describe as typically horrific, as it were. The rest is the structure of a horror story, the build up. The, the laying down of a, of a kind of base reality, which is then perturbed, um, the, the way hu human tensions seem to suggest or feed into or, or are fed into by some other kind of tension from outside. You put all that in without being Stephen King. You don't need to be Stephen King to do that. You don't even need that stuff. I read a fantastically good ghost story, a novel, the other day. I can remember neither the title nor the name of the author, but she had done exactly the same thing. She had written that absolutely typical 1970s American ghost stroke horror in which two young people with children pauper themselves to buy a house they can't afford so they can't move away from it and then find themselves in difficulties with weird knockings in the night, as it were. And she'd done that exact same thing. She had taken out most of the actual ghostly stuff. Um, in terms of, say, the, the, the amount of <coughs> words dedicated to 
telekinesis, uh, the ratio of that to the actual total number of the words in, in the novel was very low indeed. And yet it worked. I couldn't sleep but by the end of it. I was saying, you know, I, I don't know what's going on here, but it's really horrific. It's really, you know, and I find a lot of your work the same. I find your work really disturbing for the same reason. I don't know quite why I should be disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's more disturbing than anything else. Um, yeah, well, I find uh, in my work, what, uh, one of the things that I like doing is playing with the reader's reactions and and separating it from character reactions, which I think is something that you do as well. So yeah. that once the reader realizes that there is something strange or unsettling or uncomfortable going on, if you've got a character who isn't reacting to it, it actually makes it far more unsettling for... <laughs> the reader, and I think that, that you have a tendency to build in narrators yeah. that have that kind of uh, downplaying of what's happening that displaces everything. Yeah, I like, an, I like a narrator who is so alienated that basically it's only the reader who notices what's going on. Um, and then uh, I also like a narrator who is so unlikable that the, that the reader doesn't even want to warn him about what's going on. <laughs> But, but the, the, so that, as you say, the reader's reactions are what counts. You're trying to get read, the reader's reactions to the text are the, the important thing. Um, the character is almost a cipher. I, I mean, I don't think completely because I'm interested in these people who are that alienated and I'm interested in the levels of narcissism uh, in, in present day society that enable people to be that alienated from their own uh, their own feelings, their own actions, and, and uh, I'm writing a novel at the moment where there appears to be an invasion of fish people going on, and 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 the the central character is so narcissistic he never notices. <laughs> Some people in the text are beginning to get this dim idea that there's something going on, but that's as far as it goes. Um, my idea would be for the reader to be shrieking, you know, you guys, fish people, fish people. <laughs> that's that's a good segue to uh, this. Y your book has come out uh, with a kind of label of weird fiction for weird times being attached to it. And I do feel like we are living in weird times in which the fish people are showing up. And uh, Certainly are. <laughs> how, do you... How do you, how have you responded to that in your writing? I mean, because presumably most of these stories were written sort of before some of the, <laughs> the weird, the, yeah, before some of the, the, yeah, before some of the weirdness was, uh, was immediately kind of on the, on our screens in the same kind of way, but has it, did it, has it affected the way you think about writing or it indeed has. what you're working on now? It, it's not so visible in this because as you say, most of these stories were written before the worst things started to happen. I do feel a bit, uh, at the moment I feel a bit dissociated. I've had, I've had a, a very comfortable run where I've been able to be an ironical op opposite to the, uh, to the political uh, climate that I found myself in. And, and that's my whole life since, you know, certainly since I was 20, it, it's, it, there's been a very comfortable niche for writers who, who were contrarian. Uh, it was easy to take the piss. It was easy to be deeply ironic. It was easy to be cynical. It was easy to be obliquely political and, and make points in your stories. Um, I have a feeling that is now finished that, that essentially we are living in interesting times it's the, you know the old chinese curse uh, and when an author lives in interesting times i'm not quite sure that they can they can't get the free ride that i've had and i'm wondering what i'll do next basically to respond because obviously parody is over parody is finished you know the thing is self-parodying. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. Well, you, you certainly, there's nowhere left to escalate it, is there? No, no, exactly. Yeah. You can't. Um, and there doesn't seem to be much point in de-escalating. Unless you're an existentialist. I, I am wondering if we might not get a, 
uh, an absolute reaction against all forms of fiction, but especially fiction uh, that's got any fantastic element at all. Because, you know, how, how would it, how does it distinguish itself against what's going on? You know, what do we do? You, you can, uh, in light and the, uh, the, the, the trilogy of space operas, uh, is introduced the idea of um, a world which is so much like a circus that is so fantastic, a world where everybody's everyday lives are exotic to the extreme, that the only way to be contrarian to that is to go back to 1957 and start being deeply ordinary and normal and normative. And I wonder if that's not that's, that's the only doorway we have to go through. One of my PhD students, uh, Marion Womack, who's Spanish and does uh, a lot of translation, uh, she said she found weird fiction in her country interesting in that the surrealist veins really came into their own uh, during Franco's time as a way of revealing the kind of inherently irrational within supposedly rational systems. And when I did a virtual futures event uh, earlier this year, I was really interested in the extent to which weird fiction or weird ways of reading might be useful for decoding what's happening at the moment, the entire idea of reality shifting around us. And uh, But then recently I was reading a, a book called Other Russias, which was a cartoonist who had been, uh, who had gone around Russia and been, had, had been drawing short, uh, realist sketches of women in Russian culture who'd been ignored, so prostitutes and old women. And she was saying that increasingly realism feels avant-garde there, the ability to simply yeah. depict things as they are. And so now I feel really destabilized. I had thought maybe we were going to be going through a phase of surrealism, but I wonder as well if there's, if, if it's going to be going both ways at the same time, or if it's simply that whatever is marginal becomes mainstream, then whatever is mainstream gets pushed out to the margins again. It's an interesting position. I don't, I do think that we will get a swing to realism, um, that it might be tainted, um, but that, but, but the, the, the weird requires the real. We know that anyway. So we're kind of used to doing the real. Um, I think a lot of us might find ourselves just doing the real, you know, and maybe tinker toying a little bit towards the end of any given piece. I don't know. It's very interesting because, you know, at the beginning of the, of the 2000s, it was what's going to, what's going to replace postmodernism? Well, we're about to find out, <laughs> you know, I think that actually we weren't looking at the end of postmodernism then, but we are now. We said when, when the right has captured postmodernism, there's nowhere else for it to go. It's finished, really. Um, so it'd be interesting, interesting to see. So that's us getting rid of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. We've done, <laughs> we we tick, <laughs> we've tick getting rid of the 20th century. Yeah, it does feel as if it leaves writers in an interesting moment in that I found everybody who I was speaking to, you know, within the last 18 months or so, they were all saying that uh, their understanding of what their readers' responses to whatever they were producing was now radically shifted because things that had been uh, either kind of um, post-apocalyptic were now feeling sort of on the horizon. You couldn't write with the same kind of... Irony, and I, I certainly found it in the process of writing my novel uh, really disorienting, um, and it I had to go through a phase of of sort of well four or five redrafts in order to to find a new kind of grounding place for it. Yeah, yeah. The end of irony is a very frightening place to be. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things 
that I found really interesting about your writing and that I often use when I'm talking to my students is the way that you deal with world building in your stories. And because I think you offer an alternative to that uh, traditional idea of how you might write fantasy or science fiction by creating maps and by, you know, having charts and graphs and things. But you talk about world building coming out of the language itself. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about that. If you do it with, <clears throat> if, you, if you take advantage of language, you can, you can do it minimally. The great thing about that is you can do it minimally. You can do an awful lot in one sentence. You can, uh, if, if it's the only sentence the reader has got to use for interpretive purposes, they will lean on it very heavily. So you, you've, you've, and if you put it then in the right position in the story, you've really stoked it. You've filled it with as much relevance and meaning. You've made as big a pivot of it as you possibly can. And for me, I look, like, I look for that in every single piece of so-called world building. I mean, I don't think of it like that. I think of it as scene setting or yeah. mise en scene or, or any of those kinds of words that they would have used in 1920. Um, really, all you're doing is making a background that, against which the story can act, as it were. That's not quite true because backgrounds are, as we know from modernism, massively entangled with the story itself. And indeed, if you're really good, you can tell the story with the background. I hate it when people say to me, I love your backgrounds, but you can't write a story. Wrong. Those backgrounds are doing most of the work, actually. Look, you know, read, read them. Um, so I like, to, I like to use the language and I like to use... If you say, uh, during the afternoon period, there were 17 notable different cultures arose, uh, today, all we have left of them is a few pyramids and, and, and some writing in the sky. You've done it. You know? Yeah. Why, there's absolutely no point in showing all of that. It only gets in the way of the narrative. And, 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 and to be honest, that's not even the point. Because as far as I'm concerned, the narrative gets in the way of what's real about the story. Um, but... but I always recommend students to read Catherine Mansfield, you know, or Elizabeth Bowen, or any of those early, those people who are taking modernism from an experimental base into a technique that could be used in professional fiction, as it were. They really knew how to do that. Um, speaking of which, there is an Elizabeth Bowen ghost story called All Hallows' Eve which is mainly dialogue between a, a vicar who's just come out of his church at the end of a, a, an All Hallows service, <coughs> who is um, fastened upon by a, a, a rich, oldish woman who wants to give a window to the church. She wants to donate a window to the church. And as she begins to describe in, in a completely inarticulate, and desperate sort of way why she wants to donate this window, you get edgier and edgier because the vicar himself is getting edgier and edgier. He keeps saying to her, well, but actually that's, to be honest, that's not the, that's not why we do this. We, we do this because of God. We, we do this because of our love of God. And by the end of it, the vicar has run away from this woman. He has, in the, again, in the last sentence of the piece, he is seen running across the graveyard. Nothing whatsoever awful has happened. But, and, and the word ghost has never been used, but you know exactly who the ghost was. You know exactly why the vicar ran away. You know where the ideology of the story was bent, if you're a Catholic, and so on and so forth. And it's all set in a graveyard, which is sketched in in about five sentences. Uh, there's the odd description of a, of, a, of a church window. But again, five sentences, if you're lucky. And then the whole thing is maybe 3,000 words long. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do world building. Yeah, there's a lot about hysteria that can be really interesting. Uh, that sort of reminds me of Marjorie Kemp, the medieval writer, and the responses to her in which uh, she was really trying to 
to take these medieval models to heart. And so she thought that what you were supposed to be doing is weeping constantly uh, for, De for Jesus's death. And so when she wandered the streets weeping, the vicar would come up to her and say, no, 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 we, we, we aren't supposed to get that upset about it. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it's sort, of, it's sort of weirdly funny, but this idea of setting up models that when people begin to take them too seriously, there can be a real kind of strangeness to it. Yeah. So do you find that those are techniques that you end up using in your flash fiction? How do you go about writing your flash fiction? I don't. I don't. It goes about writing me, <laughs> uh, basically. Uh, I always let those things arrive, and they always arrive with a considerable urgency. Um, they want to get written down. Um, and I try not to have a rational dialogue with them um, and, until they're very clearly finished. So I can't tell you how I do it <laughs> because I, I absolutely want them to come to me. I want them to speak to me and <clears throat> I don't want rationalism to, to get in the way of any of the, the basic psychodrama or the emotional stuff um, until I've written that last line which turns it. Um, and again, that's almost often by accident. You know, you look at it and you go, scribble, scribble, scribble. Blimey. You know, why did I do that? And then two days later, you know why you did that. But you're not going to tell anybody. Yeah. You're not even going to tell yourself because that would spoil it. That would break it. Because you've still got to revise it. Yeah. You know, you might need to, out of eight or nine sentences in two or three hundred words, you might still have to rewrite four or five of them. And that is such a delicate process at that length. To, you know, get one word wrong and you've blown it, basically. You telegraph the punch or are not realized, uh, for instance. So uh, I try to remain completely irrational where the, where the very short stuff is concerned. How much, uh, how much do you plot in advance for either your longer short stories or for your novels? Are you somebody who discovers the story organically as you're moving through it or some combination of the two? It's always a combination. Um, <clears throat> the rule is start writing from an image or from a character or from a combination of images, image, character, landscape, and maybe a rough idea in quote marks, you know, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply suspicious of ideas, deeply <laughs> suspicious. Um, it seems to me that they're the insertion of the rational into something. Um, start the, so my rule is to start writing, is to write, you know, two or three thousand words, maybe up to six or seven thousand words. And then if you, if you, if you then realize it's going to go, as it were, it's got legs, there's something here that you can deal with then you sit down and you rough out a synopsis. But it is incredibly rough. And the only part where it's focused is what you're going to do next. Um, once you've done that, start writing again and keep going on that kind of process on that basis until you get somewhere near the end seven years later, which it always is with me, apparently. Um, at, at any point, I mean, I think there are times where I will go into a chapter with such a blueprint of a synopsis that I can't go wrong. Other times I will go into a chapter thinking, well, it's kind of about this. I'll see what I can do. You know, um, so and all the time you're correcting. I can't do a draft. I never do. I never draft a whole novel and then go back and, and redraft. I draft from a sentence out towards about the, the length of the scene. And then I go back and make that work. And then I, and then I do the next one. Um, it's, a, it's a massively neurotic method. I can't, I can't proceed unless it's pretty well correct, as it were. Which means that occasionally it will go through structural convulsions as I realize that I've ended up somewhere I didn't want to be or didn't need to be. Uh, or that I've written the end about five chapters too soon or, or whatever. But I'm happy to do that. It's just that I really hate writing a draft. I can't live with the draft. 
I, it's like it's wrong. It's bad. It's wrong. Yeah, I find when I write short stories, it's very much like that. In that, the I find writing the first half of a short story really brilliant because I'll begin with as soon as I've got a sentence that has a strong enough voice that makes me want to write the next sentence, I've yeah. got something that will go, and then I don't mind simply writing in almost anything that I want with the idea that I will that the joy of writing the story is figuring out how those things connect yeah. in. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the puzzle of the second half of the story is trying to solve whatever that problem <laughs> is and, and find a structure or or find a thread that does connect all of the pieces that I've that, that have felt intrinsically are important or part of the same story, but I don't entirely know how yet. Do you shuffle elements and components when you've already written them, for instance? I do I have. I've gone through phases where I've written short stories, where I've broken things up. I find if I get jammed in a short story, because I tend to write quite organically for my short stories, then sometimes what I'll do is I'll try jumping ahead in the future. So whether it's a month or five years to see, all right, so where is this story if I remove it from whatever I've been writing so far? And I find that can be an effective way of of breaking out of whatever my preconceived notions yeah, about what yeah. the story might be. Yeah. Uh, so I've done that before. And then sometimes I'll reshuffle around that. At other times, I'll just start writing another section if I find a sentence that keys me in to something. And then I'll try to figure out what maybe the link is between them. Yeah. And that's the pleasure of it. Yeah, it is the pleasure of why it. Why do I do that now? <laughs> I've got to work out why I did that. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also trying to trust yourself, isn't it? That, yep. that whatever made you think that that was the right thing to be writing uh, was correct. Yeah. And yep. uh, and trying to hold on to that feeling long enough in order to get there. Should we should we jump into some fiction now? Okay. Are you guys ready for some fiction? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Let's have some fiction, and then uh, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And you can all pick Mike's brain. Such as it is. This will depend entirely on whether there's enough light in here. <laughs> uh, these are mostly short. The, <clears throat> the first one is about a thousand words. Um, and there'll be a couple of even shorter ones after that. So you're not to blink. Because if you blink, you'll miss the shorter ones completely. Uh, this one's called Psychoarchaeology. I keep getting flashbacks to provincial streets. You're driving. We're touring the big civil engineering projects, looking for dead royals. We found a minor Plantagenet earlier today, crouched in bad cement beneath a Midlands motorway pier, for all the world as if he'd been garroted on the lavatory. Yesterday, it was a previously unknown illegitimate steward, two metres under the floor of an HS2 station with her two children, some scraps of religious writing and an older man. He's related, maybe a brother or a cousin. The molecular biology will sort that out. She's no longer the fairest of them all. Now that science tells us they're a good place to look, we're finding kings and queens under every parking structure in the UK, just lining up to present their DNA for inspection. They choked on items of food, bled out on a moor during some predictable turf war, suffered a beheading they might have avoided if they'd learned how to work a room and not piss off the archbishop. There's no more sense to the way we find them than in a feature-length rerun of Waking the Dead or Silent Witness. Their circumstances seem no less incoherent, post-historical. Their post-death narratives no less fatuous. Their hands are clenched and presented in the boxer position as if to hang on to the good things they grabbed in life. We're coming up on the airport now, you say. The data indicates Habsburgs, lots of them. I say, 
you know, I think we should get takeaway first. DNA, the last word in personal identification. Along with every one of these corpses, there's a buried irony. It's to do with privilege transmitted in the blood. DNA, after all, was the reason for all their hugger-mugger in the first place. The plot in the provinces, the rat in the arras, the neck bent before the axe, the smothering of little princes, the slaughter of serfs in an open field somewhere near Bosworth, the unrelenting sexual intercourse, the dogged monotony of the royal way of life. Now, here they are, their hack marks intact, identified, betrayed, some might say, by the very chemistry that drove them through their crap lives. DNA is the meat of it. So we eat in the car on the South Perimeter Road, staring through the chain link fence, and you say, what will the heritage industry do when it runs out of kings? The airport is like a vast construction site. In one corner, heavy-duty, ground-penetrating radar is still grinding to and fro. If there's a pea left under this mattress, the radar will find it. Elsewhere, the field-walking and heritage solutions teams have been and gone. Trench trials are over. Strip, map and record is underway. Ranks of powerful backhoes on standby for a month, manoeuvre in and out of the shadows. The aircraft are mothballed, the runways are up, the overburden is off. They're ripping down to the first archaeological horizon. The schedule's tight. Time is money in more ways than one. Generator exhaust drifts through the cones of light from a thousand portable halide lamps, under which celebrity academics gangbang the past in front of cameras in high-vis wear and sterile paper suits. There's a palpable sense of excitement. Can they hear us, the queens and kings, through the impacted earth? Do they know we're on our way down? For them, the truth will soon be out. They come to light pre-butchered, grinning shyly, stripped to the bones and teeth for on-site strontium isotope analysis. There's no option but honesty for them in this respect. After the imbroglio of history, chemistry must seem simple, even refreshing. But things are more complex for us, especially when we work for the heritage police. Because there's always a rights issue, where does the latest Tudor belong? Does he belong where he was found? Or whence he came? Who gets the brown sign? One wrong decision, and York won't talk to Leicester, and the knives are out again after hundreds of years of peace, contracts torn up, the industry at war with itself. We all know where that can lead. Diminished footfall in the visitor centres. No one wants to see that. In the end, of course, presentation is nine-tenths of the law. Dig for the evidence, develop the interactive exhibit, crowdsource the story the public wants to hear. It's the contemporary equivalent, you say, of the religious relics industry. You wind down the window and you chuck the remains of your burger into the shadows of the lay-by. Only this time, you add, the relics are real. Well, that's very postmodern, I say. It's as if our obsession with dead royals has in itself made them available in such numbers. Why have we suddenly started digging them up like this? Out of nervousness? Out of the need for a psychic anchor? out of economic desperation, so that having run out of each other's washing to take in, we now take in one another's ancestors. Why not let them lie? It's certainly not possible to learn from them. All they mean to us is what we want them to mean. 
to claim that we can learn from them because they had at base the same emotions as us, the same satisfactions, the same fears, the same needs, is in itself a projection. They aren't the past in any material sense. Brought to light, they're what they are now, not what they were then. At best, they're a geological resource, perhaps not as valuable as uranium, but more easily available, and each containing enough energy to power a couple of careers, a biography, an MA course, a BBC4 series. All this, you tell me, is so hackneyed and played out. I've heard you say as much before. And so I shrug and I start the engine and I say, let's get this over with then. It can't be long before the DNA of Richard III's horse is detected in processed food in the Republic of Ireland. <laughs> That'll open up some new fields of research. Psychogeography. This one's almost the opposite. It's, it's very short, it's called Explaining the Undiscovered Continent. I should add that it, it clearly fails to do that. All things metal tapping together in the wind, bleached fish bones 1,000 miles from the sea, sheds where you can get directions and diving apparatus, the inevitable airstream trailer, the inevitable rusty boiler, the inevitable graffito of a sealer canth, the high line of the last tide strewn with yellowish swim bladders of unknown animals like condoms inflated and then varnished into fragility, kilometre upon kilometre of unravelled polypropylene rope, tin signs, tied knots, a sense of petrol, and then the cliffs with their abandoned funicular slicing up through the maroon sandstone to the plateau above. Windows of static ice cream parlours, buildings filled to the fourth storey with the grey flock from old padded bags. This is where we'll dive. As far as anyone can tell, they lived in threes or fives, odd numbers anyway. Each household kept a small dinosaur on a bit of coloured string. We have no idea who they were or when they were here, or what they wanted out of life. That's the attraction. And afterwards, to sit in the boat, tired, happy, <clears throat> washing a small blue item in the most gentle solvent. No one will ever know what it is. And finally, a bad dream. I woke up from a dream about losing my identity and not being able to find anything that would confirm it. It wasn't a dream about the problem of losing your identity. Neither was it a dream about, say, the horror of not having a financial identity. In the dream, loss of identity was not a condition that required explanation or a way of escape in either of those senses, or in any other sense, it was just a condition. I was in the town of my birth. I hadn't been there for decades. I was at the station, at a sort of advice counter. The man behind the counter was amused. It was as if he didn't understand the extent of the problem. It was as if he couldn't believe that anyone could lose their identity. I was trying to appear cheerful about the situation. I had a tarpaulin travel bag containing a few clothes and some other personal items. It was also full of bits of waste paper and receipts. And each time I went through this litter in the hope that a credit card or a phone or, or other identifier would turn up, it seemed to be more useless. Who would help me? Though I couldn't remember any addresses I knew, I could physically make my way to one person's house. 
but I'd long ago fallen out with them. Thank you. It's really lovely. Uh, should we open it up to the audience now? I think we have a roaming mic. If anybody has any questions. Any questions at all? Hello. Hi. Um, thank you. That, I was just scribbling down that last bit about falling out with people. I love that. Um, my question was about, I, I was interested in what you said about um, how the messiness of a draft was something that was unlivable with, like you needed to finish a section and then go on to the next one, even if you found out later you went back and changed it. Um, I'm curious about climbing and how, do you, do you think that's sort of part of your writing process, like the physical climbing and how you traverse something is, is kind of reflected in your, your um, way of writing, if that makes sense. Sorry, it's a bit of an incoherent it, question. It does, but, it, but in fact, no, uh, because uh, the, the, the main point of climbing, especially modern climbing and uh, the, the, the kind of difficult climbing I used to do, but, 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 which I don't do anymore, uh, is that you keep moving. You have to keep moving. You can't even stay still. The holes are too small. Um, you need to make very fast assessments, uh, and obviously they need to be right. Uh, you don't get a chance to redraft a climb in that sense. You can't go back and fix it, uh, or it's highly unlikely. The only time I've taken a big fall uh, to the ground was when I tried to reverse a climb like that, um, which is the, the equivalent of redrafting, as it were. Um, so n no, from the very beginning, I like a clean sheet of paper, and I like it to look as if it's already published, basically. Um, and if it's not like that, in the days of paper, I would crumple it up and have it in the way it's been before you could say Jack Robinson. Uh, computers were great for me because I didn't need to crumple the paper up anymore. Um, I like it to look right, and I like it to be right. Um, and I, I don't mind going back and putting a can opener on it. Um, shuffling sections around is one of my favorite things, uh, mainly because it gives you some ideas about the timeline that you might not have had before, for instance, um, or the character's lives, uh, and the speed or the, um, not so much the causalities, but what's, whatever stands in for causality in my stuff. I would, I would be ashamed to have proper causality, obviously. So, yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions at all? Hi. Um, you mentioned that in your 20s, I think you said, um, you were sort of still learning your craft and, and all the rest of it, and then now you're you can do it. I'm just wondering, was there, was there a sort of moment where you thought I can do this? And, and what was that like? If there was one, you get about one every five weeks. I get about one every five weeks, even now at the age of 72, it's like, now I can do it. Now I can really do it. Now I thought I could do it, but now I can really do it. And I think, um, it's nice to be a slow learner. You know, I'm quite a slow learner. It takes me a while to get around, to get, to get my mind around anything. And when you're also trying to learn your own way of doing it, then that makes it doubly difficult because you don't actually know what it is until you see it, until you've done it. Uh, and the astonishment with which I regard a piece that has actually worked, uh, even now, uh, it's what I live for, really, as, as a writer, is that moment of, oh my God, I really learned to do it. That's fantastic. <laughs> this is great. Um, I think it happens less when you're younger. It's just more of a struggle. Obviously, there's so much to learn. Learn is maybe not quite the right word, in a way. If you're trying to learn it from other writers or other fictions, I think you may already have gone off on a 
and what might be a, in, a, in a wrong direction. What you're really looking for is to get in touch with whatever's in your heart or your head and f finding your own ways of um, your own techniques for expressing that, your own typical combinations of characters and scenes and events and, and so on and so forth. And you, you also go through huge phase changes. I don't know if you find this, but every 10 years I seem to go through another phase jump. Well, uh, I, I don't think, I haven't been writing for 10 years yet, so I haven't gone through oh, that. Oh, well then, <laughs> my dear, you have so much to learn. I, I assume that there is one coming. But actually, I found every, every collection of short stories I have done, I have felt like they encapsulated a moment of my life and a way of thinking about the yep. world, and that they're different each time so i don't feel like i could write my first collection of short stories again and right now i don't think i could write my second collection of short no, stories again. you can't you sort of you can't go back you've jumped yeah. a gap of some kind um, yeah you've learned something you can't forget and weirdly enough while it enables you to do things it also disables you from doing the old things yeah that yeah. what uh, that question made me think is there anything that you look back on your past self as being able to do that now you can't do yeah, any kind of um, any kind of fantasy, any kind of typical fantasy, as it were. I just can't do it, um, and I think the same would be true if I ever tried to do science fiction. But but I've never really tried to do typical science fiction anyway. So, um, but yeah, I think um, once you once you've learned certain kinds of, for me, it's always technical. There are, there are techniques that that I got when I was about 30 that made it impossible for me to go back and write sword and sorcery style epic fantasy. They wouldn't allow it. Have you really only been going for 10 years? I think uh, when, I, when I first met you, which would have been about in 2012, I had been writing for about, uh, I had been writing and publishing for about 18 months at that point with short fiction. So, oh god. Yeah. I mean, I had been reading I had been writing poetry beforehand, but uh yeah, I'm quite young. <laughs> Have you finished a novel yet? I uh, I finished the same novel several times. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ticket. <laughs> I, I I do one more question. I, uh, you both sort of referred, and I, I speak not as a writer, but actually as someone whose partner is um, interested in, 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 in starting to learn to write. She's been working in journalism. She started a creative writing course quite recently and is getting quite interested in the art of writing, which I think both of you have spoken about, the craft of it and the skill of it. Um, yet as writers, you have also talked about this weirdness or this weirding of the world that's occurring that your genre pardon me, um, is challenged to address now. So I guess my question is, what's your task? What do you personally feel is your task as a writer over the next few years? Is it to find another space in which to write or perhaps another oblique reference with which to speak to the world? Or is it to explore your craft and to explore how you work with your craft? Uh, normally I, I do the second automatically because I work through the technique uh, I tend to work, I tend, most of my, even short stories, but certainly novels, uh, they don't arrive as plots with human characters in them. They arrive as formal structures, uh, usually broken. I, I usually think to myself, I'm fascinated by that X, structure X. Uh, you know, for instance, the, the novel I was talking about, um, the typical Stephen King haunted house kind of 1970s thing. Um, and I will, I, will, I will say to myself, that's a brilliant structure, but it's wrong. How can I break it so that it's right? How can I break it so it's, for instance, much more realistic? Uh, so it, it seems to me to realistic, re realistically reflect the world rather than to, to escape it. So for me, I th I've written two or three novels which were essentially formal statements to start with um, and which were then climbers for instance was um, how do I write the very typical uh, autobiographical surfing novel you know 
um, climbers is a, a deconstructed autobiographical surfing novel, but with the truth, as it were, rather than the romantic kind of thing. Even, uh, is it Black Wednesday? Big Wednesday. Even Big Wednesday isn't, isn't as realistic as it could be. Um, it's not grim enough, I think, really, in terms of the, the catastrophic commitment that, that guys like that put into, into doing that. So Climbers was designed to be about catastrophic levels of obsession. When I say catastrophic, I mean in terms of one's normal life. Um, and originally I had intended to write a, about surfing. And I thought, damn, that means I've got to go to Cornwall and learn how to surf. And I sat there and I thought for a bit. And then I thought, wait a minute, Mike, this is something you already do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, which is that people by people are e even more obsessive than surfers. Um, but yeah, for me, I, for me, it's always a matter of form. And so in a sense, what I will be doing next is riffling through my kind of vocabulary of interesting forms and possible forms and forms that I want to revisit and seeing how they would relate to the way the world is changing to enable me to do something um, and then begin begin modifying the form and listen to what it's telling me about politics. I think I went through a phase of incredible earnestness and activism. And now when I go back to my writing, I find that, I mean, writing for me has always been a way of working out how I feel about what's going on. And so writing still continues to be a really good tool for doing that. And I don't know that I feel like I need to produce answers because I'm not sure that that's what fiction does best. It's not necessarily producing answers, but it's it's highlighting problems and highlighting inconsistencies in truths and gaps and flaws and fissures. And I think that, that I think that's something we do need right now. I think we need to kind of continue to uh, to find those gaps in the narratives that are being presented to us and use that as a way to challenge them. But also I, I think kind of resistance can come in the self and simply by maintaining a strong hold on who you are, even when the world around you is changing dramatically. And I think writing is a good way of getting in touch, as you were saying, with yourself and what it is that you're thinking, what it is that you're feeling and holding mm. on to that instead of letting other people tell you what you ought to be thinking or feeling about what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a language. It's a language that you learn as it were, a personal language. Um, yeah. Your, your discipline helps you um, link to the world, uh, even climbing, you know, even obsessive climbing is a discipline. It, it's a form and it can tell you things about life. I think one of the things that writing can do in a situation like this too is, is oddly enough, I mean, I wouldn't have said this when I was 20, certainly, but you can provide stable ground, stable emotional ground, um, whether that's because I'm old or whether it's because this the situation we're now in is a bit like a, a Baroque space opera. <laughs> you know, it has about that much relationship to reality um, that we might need some stable ground. And that goes back to the kind of existential thing for me, that basically in the end, we might find ourselves just looking at things on behalf of the reader. How you make that into fiction, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, um, as I was traveling down here, I found myself thinking about Jerry Cornelius, as one does. And um, I wondered, you, you, you were one of the, group of New World writers who is generally acknowledged to have understood best the, the Cornelius character, the all-purpose anti-hero created by Moorcock, and to have written the best of the stories and the comic strips that went with that character. 
And I wondered what um, Cherry Cornelius would make of the world and the world uh, that we live in today and what the people who created those Jerry Cornelius stories, yourself and Moorcock and Spinrad and others, would make of the world of fiction that's around us now, which, which you touched on earlier when you were talking about um, reality being bent and distorted. I mean, I think that's exactly the problem. I mean, I don't think there is any place for that kind of character anymore or for those kinds of stories. They've been um, trumped, literally trumped, by reality. Uh, I was chatting to Jack Womack recently, um, who, as you know, wrote a, a series of the most astonishingly savage, ironic pictures of the near future, uh, which, frankly, we've already gone past. We've already gone past it. Um, I don't. I don't think there's any place. Those those kinds of stories work best against a society that has um, that has become so stable that you can work against it. I, I don't mean against necessarily in a political sense, but but you can. It, it becomes something you can push against. Um, what would what would a character like that push against anymore? Um, Jack and I often discuss this because we we are now beginning to feel as if we've been left behind by the world, which is very sad. Yes, well, you know, I'm not sure that's the way to go either. Um, no, uh, I confess that for me this is one of the big problems. That, that essentially that kind of super parodic SF uh, and certainly that kind of postmodern SF has no position at the moment. Um, whether one, whether things will stabilize to such a degree that that, that, that will that be possible again, I don't know. Uh, should we get a dystopia, a genuine dystopia, then there will be something to do for all of us. Um, at the moment, I can't see I can't see a way forward personally, except to keep hoeing my own row. Uh, really. Any other questions at all? If not, Mike, I, I want to ask you a question about the cultures around fiction and science fiction, specifically in London, and how you've seen uh, communities of writers change across the years that you've been working in this field. That's very general. So, um, so you tell these wonderful stories of, of your time with um, uh, the, the gentleman who founded uh, Tim Etchell's and Tim Etchell's kind of collective of artists and, and writers and, and whether you think that kind of culture still exists in London and if so, where can it be found? I don't know. I mean, Tim's still in London and he's still working and he's still as exciting as he ever was and he's still as tired as he ever was because he works far too hard. Um, I don't know. For me, it's always been luck. I have always blundered into these things. I blundered into the new wave in the 60s at exactly the right time to see, to see it at, at its most astonishing and, and also to see the whole of Ladbrook Grove culture and Westbourne Park culture uh, begin to watch uh, whatever whatever movement was going to come out of bands like Hawkwind and the Pink Fairies and uh, all those psychedelic bands in the early 70s. All of that I looked into. Um, and I looked into Forced Entertainment and, and Tim Etchell's in the same way. Somebody took me to a performance of, I think, their third piece in about 1994. And I would was so electrified, I didn't know what to do with myself. I sat there thinking, this is impossible. And I must make notes, but I can't think. <laughs> I mean, I was totally astonished. Um, I'm going to see their new piece on Thursday, in fact, I think, in Birmingham. 
but I can't speak about it in terms of um, actually browsing on on centers of culture and new centers of culture and the replacing of centers of culture. For instance, I completely missed out on psychogeography. Uh, I didn't have any contact with Ian Sinclair, although I'd met him a couple of times, so I know him. Um, but there was no, I didn't plug into that one. I completely missed psychogeography. And although I was at, in a way at the beginning of hauntology, I missed most of hauntology too, partly because I didn't agree with it. It, it. it didn't suit me or I didn't agree with it in the sense of not agreeing with a curry. You know, it, it wasn't my kind of thing. I prefer the uncanny. Um, so to answer that, I can't really answer that. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Just at the back. Sorry. Thank you. Hi there. Um, yeah, I was really intrigued by the way you, you talked about when, when you learn a new technique that that renders certain ways of writing kind of impossible. You know, you can't go back to the way you were. And, you know, I tend to think of a technique as, oh, you structure a story in a certain way or whatever. But you seem to be talking about it as something much deeper, a kind of deep shift in understanding or some sort of ethical shift. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit about, you know, what, what a technique is to you, what, what, what you're talking about there. You can't do anything without technique. Every time you use a technique, you're connecting it to your deep self. It, 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 it's not a thing on its own. Although it is a thing on its own, it, it, the technique is a technique, but you can get to yourself through your technique, just as some folk come to their technique through themselves, through their needs. Um, I, I just happen to be one of these people who, who goes through the technique to the subject matter, uh, which uh, it's not the usual way of it, but I, I do feel that the, way, the ways that you choose to tell reflect what you think about the things that you're telling and in fact you could go further and say they are somehow the underlying structures the deep structures of the things that you're telling um i feel more at home with a kind of the buzz i get from recognizing that that this is the right technique to say the right thing and that I didn't know what the right thing to say was until I knew what the technique was to say it. It's like, it just feels pure to me. Um, I'm aware that most people come to it the other way around. Um, but certainly it's my experience that if you learn to, if you learn a technique in say characterization, that means that you can do, say, for instance, more subtle characterizations than, you, than you're used to doing. If you break a barrier and go through that and think, wow, you know, I've learned from this or that other writer a way of, of writing about people more subtly, you're marooned. You're stuck with that. You, you, you find that you can't go back. You can't write about people in the rather crude way as you now see it that you did before. And that means that some kinds of fiction are now banned to you. It means that you can't write a fiction which will work on crude characterization. You, you can't do it anymore. It's not even that you can't bring yourself to do it. It's that you've lost those techniques to get this new one. Um, that's how I see it. That's not much of an answer, is it, Al? I'm uh, sorry. No, that's, that's great. It's very helpful. So thank you. I, I find, I think, that way about plotting, actually. Plotting is one of those elements that I feel like I went through phases where I learned how to plot things more conventionally. And then when I, I reached a certain point where uh, I suddenly started breaking from that, and now I feel like it's very difficult to go back and write conventional plot uh, because I, f I think what you're saying is right. It's not just that I can't bring myself to do it. It's simply that I can't 
the energy feels entirely wrong when I'm doing it. And so I can't respond to it the way that you need to in order to be able to pull it off. So I can yeah. only kind of get that energy by going in a different direction. Yeah. 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 It's a trap. <laughs> it is a trap. Because <laughs> yeah, you, you do lose the ability to do things that you possibly could have done before. Um, because it is a little bit like like finding a way of seeing. You know, you can't see from every direction at once. So once you sort of change position and figure out how to see from another way. It's a parallax thing. Yeah. 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 I think so. And also what you're able to do changes your ambitions, obviously. Changes what you want to be able to do. Um, and it um, and it often brings completely unknown shifts and changes, stuff that you could never have predicted. I love it. I love these phase jumps where, you know, suddenly you're standing the other side of it and you can do all these things. You've moved on. And it's like, it's like a climb. Uh, it's like that kind of climb where uh, you really had no idea what you were going to do next. And suddenly you're standing the other side of it and you're moderately safe again. Uh, and you, and you know, all these opportunities life opportunities are stretching before you. Um, I like that. And I, I, I mean, I learned climbing that way. I learned to sort of um, do repetitive exercises and problems and classic routes until suddenly one day you, you managed to make a move which you knew would push you to the next level. Climbing is all about moving up the grades from the easiest to the to the to the hardest you can do, and you don't feel right unless you're doing the hardest thing you can do. But these forward jumps that you can make, so you've gone up like three grades in a day, and you think that's it, till the next day, of course. <laughs> Any other questions? I've got sort of a question. <laughs> Um, well, when I've been writing, I've been like writing in different forms and I always find that constraints are actually quite helpful and like, you know, can generate this creativity that, you know, like I've done theatre and poetry and um, I'm working on AR stories at the moment. So, I mean, I was wondering um, what you think, like constraints in terms of narrative and so on, like you were saying that certain genres are not available in the future, do you think the constraints will actually help generate a new sort of movement or form? Or I think they might. My interesting story about constraints at the moment is Twitter. Oh. You know, the ultimate constraint was 140 characters. S suddenly they give you 280 and you honestly don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Everything you write at 280 looks completely lumpen because you've <laughs> developed all these techniques for writing these beautiful, slick little 140s, you know, which get it all in. And you think, wow, I'm good at this now. I really am good at this now. And then they ruin it, you know. The constraint was everything. Um, and I certainly, I like these shorter pieces because the, the length actually acts as a constraint. I try not to go over 300 words, um, for instance. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all in favour of working in constraining media until you begin to find them a nuisance. The moment you find it a nuisance, you need to move on or you need to pick and mix your constraints, you know, um, and, and you need to one day ask yourself the mad question, can I use the forms and techniques from this genre to operate this genre? Uh, how can I use the some of the typical processes of uh, non-fiction to write fiction or the other way around um, and that's produced huge steps forward uh, historically uh, the new journalists in the 60s and 70s applying the techniques of fiction to non-fiction um, it was it was wrong it was bad but it worked you know it made the most exciting uh, journalistic non-fiction no, I think a, a, a mixed process of, of constraining yourself to find out what you can do and then 
breaking breaking out and you know going balmy. That's that's the best thing. Is there any other questions? And if if not, Mike, that reminds me, I need to look at what Jeff Noon's now doing with his 280 characters yes. on Twitter. Um, the, the second thing, though, my question is really about generational approaches to science fiction. We, we launched a series of near future fiction events here under Virtual Futures because we were realizing that our audience were approaching some of the tech topics that the, we were looking at through the lens of science fiction. The sorts of science fiction they were discovering was the sorts of science fiction through Netflix. So their first experience of experiencing weird fiction or science fiction is, oh yes, no, I love science fiction. That's, that's series three, episode two of Black Mirror is brilliant. And I just wondered what your thoughts on how new generations are discovering things like The Handmaid's Tale through the Netflix series before they realized it was a book by Margaret Atwood and, and Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror. I just wondered your thoughts on that. I think that to the extent that any kind of new way of doing things evolves, that's great. I worry that Netflix style sci-fi has a long uh, history of heritage. It's a kind of heritage sci-fi. Uh, I've watched, recently I watched the OA, which was a Netflix thing, and it was a compendium of, of stuff that I'd read in 1953, you know, when I was a kid and I was ill, and I read the sci-fi magazines. And I thought, well, this is, I mean, I hate the term reinventing the wheel because I think everybody should reinvent the wheel. But it is that some of the Netflix stuff that I see seems to me to to not only be perfectly mimicking and reinventing the 1980s or the 1970s, but also some of the uh, indeed many of the of the SF tropes and horror tropes of that time. Um, I'm watching uh, Stranger Things at the moment. And it's nice, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, there's the occasional actual free song. But I've seen it all before a bit. Um, and, I, and I keep saying, well, what else can you show me? You know, what else can you produce here that will, that will, um, that will scare the pants off me or, or give me a real sense that, that you, as somebody who's 24 years old, have, have, have dug into the material from a new angle and come up with something shocking. Now, I, I also know at the same time as I'm thinking that, I'm 70 years old. And so I'm going to get this feeling that I've seen it all before anyway. And I'm not necessarily going to be right about that. So I don't know. Again, I think I'm, in a way, the wrong person to ask that question. Um, but uh, I'm kind of enjoying Stranger Things. Sometimes it irritates the hell out of me. I mean, I really don't know why you would do such a perfect imitation of Stephen King. Because Stephen King is there, and you could look at the Stephen Kings. Um, oh, sorry. I, just, yeah. I actually have a lot of thoughts about this because I deal with a lot of students and undergraduates whose experiences of science fiction and fantasy are largely through film, television, and video games. And I think... I think there are some good reference points out for, to them. It's good because it brings them to the genre. Uh, I think the challenge is if they want to be fiction writers, the one thing that they don't get out of those forms is dealing with the language. And I think in order to be a really good writer, you have to be reading a lot because you have to be able to work in language. And what they're developing is a good sense of, of a visual medium. So it'll be interesting to see if they go in that direction. Uh, but also, I was uh, I was doing another of these events with Michael Durda, who's a journalist from the Washington Post, and he was talking about how big shifts often come when some sort of 
fringe genre gets incorporated or gets reworked. And I was asking him what he, science fiction doesn't feel like a fringe genre in the way that it used to. So what are the, what are the fringe genres that might be reinvigorating a kind of central literary culture? He was talking about things like video games, and I wonder if we haven't seen it entirely yet. We've seen instances of amazing storytelling in video games, but I do wonder if that's if some of these areas that right now are beginning to experiment uh, and are starting to catch on, if we're going to see a kind of revolution that's happening in those places that will sort of reflect back on what we're doing. I don't know if we're entirely there yet in terms of uh, the students that I talk to, but I also think maybe they'll get bored with it the way that, you know, I felt like the stuff that I was reading when I was 15 or 18, you know, kind of the big epic fantasy Robert Jordan materials, I got bored with and then I started trying to figure out how to break it. And so maybe they'll do the, I, what I would hope is that they'll find a way to do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Certainly what, I, you know, what I see on Netflix is is in sore need of breaking. The other thing is it's too perfect. A lot of it's structured too well. It's got that. It's got the Disney problem. I forget who it was said of Disney that the problem is he tells too perfect a story. It's just too perfectly structured, um, and you get that feeling with Netflix. You get the feeling that um, every single plot beat has been, you know, placed utterly perfectly. Every single character beat has been placed utterly perfectly, and it's breathtaking. But actually, I wonder if it's not a bit restrictive. So actually, uh, the, the question I was going to ask, there's a lot of overlap with uh, your observations there. Uh, and that was that um, medium of publication or medium of delivery uh, it clearly has both opened up new possibilities for fiction over the years, you know, uh, more faster publications, splash magazines, that kind of stuff for science fiction in particular. And that we're sitting here, you know, commenting on having an extra 140 characters. Are there any breaking technologies, just to make it very VF based, in which fiction can explore, with which we should explore from fiction's perspective in the in this field? Computer games being one, um, I think I can see that. AR being another. Uh, are you writing for anything other than prose? I'm not. I have to say that I'm not. Um, I. I, I was always interested in <clears throat> any kind of film, any kind of TV, but I find that I can't, I can't make <clears throat> the types of structures that are necessary to do that. Um, and even worse, or even better, I cannot work with anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I do not play well with other children, as it were. Um, it's um, a team effort that kind of fiction. Um, and I need to be basically in a windowless room with a computer and no distractions and um, uh, in touch with whatever surreal nonsense is going on in my head. <clears throat> That's how I learned what writing was. And so, in a sense, I betray my age. Have, you ever, tried write, have you ever tried writing in hypertext or for hypertext? I would very much like to write a hypertext, but I'm not clever enough. I think you need to be quite clever to do that, to really take advantage of that medium. I would love to experiment and probably will eventually. I thought of using my blog to experiment with that. Um, if you need technical support, you just ask, yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, Jagex Games recently and a bunch of the writers at Jagex Games who work on massive multiplayer online games. And I found it was so exciting actually to hear the sort of challenges that they faced when they were trying to put together quests and campaigns. Because even though, you know, the genre is very designed to be traditional and designed not to be experimental, but the way in which they tell stories and the way in which they engage their characters and have to reinvent ideas of stakes and participation and interaction, I felt was so exciting because those are challenges that they haven't solved yet entirely. And they do, and they're experimenting as a way to do it. So I feel like there's going to be new ways of telling stories that are going to come out of technologies like that. We've got a generation of computer games. So people have been playing on mobile and interactions for 15 years. Yeah. 
Yeah, and also, you know, the extent to which they're also thinking about can they use AI in order to be able to generate quests? So how do they solve the problem of real interactivity um, that is scalable to be able to deal with that number of players? And uh, so I think... I think a good place to find revolution is where you have problems. And the fact that they're encountering a lot of problems means that there's going to be an interesting space that opens up as, as various companies uh, and various people figure out ways to solve those problems effectively. On that note, um, just a couple of thank yous. Um, the first one is to, to the Library Club for, for hosting us. This, this venue has been very, very kind to us. We've hosted um, God knows how many events here now, and, and they always do an absolutely fantastic um, job. And if you like what we do, please support us. We're entirely audience funded. You can find out more about Virtual Futures and the other sorts of events we do at Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere online. And as I teased, we do do a series of near future fiction events. We have four uh, next year. And if you want to know more about those, Stephen Oram just at the front here uh, is, is looking after and, and curating those for 2018. And I want to end with this, which is how we end every single Virtual Futures. And it's with a warning and it's the fact that the future is always virtual and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Dr. Helen Marshall and M. John Harrison. The bar is now open.